Welcome back as we continue with uh, global news here on the globe. The world is uh, continuing to reflect on the death and legacy of uh, Queen Elizabeth II. As it does so, three of films and documentaries have over the years done their bit to memorialize her reign. The latest is a tribute to Her Majesty the Queen, a BBC documentary. Of course, you can't talk about Queen Elizabeth II on screen without mentioning The Crown, Netflix's major series, other productions to Stream now are also the Queen featuring Dame Helen Mirren, who won an Oscar for Best Actress for playing the title role. Now, as we critique, critique how Her Majesty's legacy has spawned a lot of productions, how uh, have they told uh, their role in Africa and colonialism? We ask this question. We're joined now by Dr. Kwesi Owusu, an award-winning artist with credits of film, music, and the literary arts. His uh, first feature film, Ama, for Channel 4 television in the UK is considered a classic of magic realism. Uh, he joins us now to talk about this. A very good evening to you and thank you so much for speaking to us, Dr. Awosu. So you are a member of the Black Triangle Consortium that acquired the Electric Cinema in London in 1993, which turned it into the first black cinema house in Europe. What is your observation of how Queen Elizabeth II has been documented, particularly the African narrative, her role in it? Well, first of all, let me just say uh, the mood in London is very somber here as uh, people pay their last respects to Queen Elizabeth II, who happens to be the longest uh, reigning monarch um, until a few days ago. So uh, we all pay our due respects to her. Um, as, uh, it's also important to appreciate the fact that uh, she came to the throne at, at the dawn of the age of mass media. Her coronation in 1953 was the first national television event um, in Britain. And of course, since then, every step she took in public was captured on film. So her relationship with the media and film and so very, 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 very close, not just in the UK, but across the world. In Africa, in, in Ghana, definitely, uh, just to prepare for this program, I was looking at some of the photographs of the royal visit in 19. 61 in Ghana, and she was the most photographed, very young, very charming, and made a great impact. But of course, the, uh, the narrative which, of which she was a part, which she played a critical role, was uh, a colonial project in many ways. And uh, that project, of course, uh, was more interested in uh, the Brit British interest, if you like, British empire building than giving opportunity or spaces for real African voices. And that I think is the critical component that we really need discussing now, especially as her reign has more or less come to an end. It gives us a great opportunity to look back and see what we can do about all the silences which were, became almost functional, institutionalized uh, during her reign. There were so many stories about, for example, Ghana's independence, which were never told to the world. Of course, we've, we've had ways of telling our stories from the sidelines. But I think um, it's a long time since 1953 when she, she was crowned uh, queen. Um, this is a time, a great opportunity to have a space where Africans can also tell they are real stories mm. to the mainstream of the global media. And I want to zo uh, zoom in a little bit more on that. I mean, just uh, reflecting on her first speech, she uh, said, I declare before you that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family, which we all belong. Now, and the importance of that is uh, in our underscore imperial family, the effects of that, particularly on Africa. So some productions have had a greater degree of factual material than others. But how many of them have leaned on the knowledge of Africans, consulting them or including them in telling how she was involved in the Commonwealth and particularly colonialism? She was head of state, Absolutely. head of government, but, you know, that is an important... She was head of state, mm. she was actually head of state of 26 sovereign um, nations 
Of course, that had reduced to about 14 at the end of her reign. But clearly, when she talks about the, the colonial imperial family, um, it's very much part and parcel, as I mentioned before, of the colonial uh, project. Um, you know, we looking at the history from, from slavery until the colonial period and so on, and it's been more or less literally a one-way traffic in terms of, you know, economic transmissions of, of wealth and so on. But, but culturally, um, you know, education-wise, I, I learned more about the royal family than I, I learned about my own African families, not least in other African countries. Um, other than my, my, other than the British, so in many ways the, the, the narrative needs to be changed, and this is a great opportunity uh, to do that. There are so many films that have to be made, you know, Shaka de Zulu, Ya Asantiwa, and of course, you know, ordinary people. I must uh, tell you a, a little personal anecdote. My mother actually shared a birthday with Queen Elizabeth, um, so you can imagine how. She became integral to our household. I remember sending messages to her every, you know, when my mother got a bit old to Queen Elizabeth. Whether she read them or not, I don't know. But uh, who knows about, about her, you know, on, on whatever level. And I, I, for me, I think her story is also as important, you know, as any other British woman, not least the Queen. So why not? So in many ways, we need to open the door for more African stories to be told. And that really is a time now. Mm. And I want to talk about her influence, Queen Elizabeth's contribution uh, to growing the arts and encouraging particularly an authentic African voice in telling the European history and how it relates to Africa. As you said, it was somehow intertwined. And, and were you able to have some flexibility, autonomy in doing that when you were at uh, the uh, Black Cinema House in Europe? There's a whole history to that, obviously, and uh, we clearly had the need to create a, a special focus for black filmmaking and black films, which were not getting exhibited. So the electric cinema was quite critical in creating a showcase, and it became hugely popular where we, you know, we showed films like Sankofa by African filmmakers. I made some wonderful documentaries about some African filmmakers, Menhondo, Sarawinia, and, you know, Hollywood films by Spike Lee, John, um, John Singleton and the others also had a look in. And it was fantastic. But the point is that we've always been on the sidelines. This is an opportunity to actually move into the center of the, of the global media. And that is really what the issue is now in many ways. So and, and, and the stories are intertwined in many ways. One is not going to tell isolationist stories. My story is very much a British story as any, any British person living in Ghana or in Africa. But there are distinctive elements which I can bring to the table that a British boy, you know, having lived in Liverpool or somewhere can never ever do because I embody a particular unique experience. Mm. And that is really what a colonial project denied. And that is something that we need to assess and, and make sure that we finally are not speaking from the sidelines, but speaking within the mainstream of okay. the global media. So you mentioned an opportunity for change. It is a new era, but uh, King Charles III has pretty much said that he'll follow in his mother's footsteps. So one can argue that the more things change, the more they stay the same. So how do we as Africans... Um, you know, grab this opportunity. You've uh, launched a platform, um, the African Dawn podcast, to enhance how we tell our own stories. So how could we use that to tell stories for Africans, by Africans, as you're doing now? Tell us a little bit more about that, particularly through the prism of the African Dawn podcast. So as you are saying, I think it's absolutely important to create the structures and the channels through which we tell the stories. And the global media is stratified in many ways in which it's not quite easy to get, get an entry. But I think uh, the, there are certain openings which can be, you know, can be utilized at this particular point. 
and we have decided to create a, a globally recognized podcast, um, which basically is a, a very interesting way of, of putting in content, documentaries, films, you know, audio narratives and so on, which can be listened to quite easily on the net. And that really is the next frontier. And we are creating this African Dawn podcast, and we call it the Dawn podcast, because it symbolizes a new beginning in this very exciting journey. Mm. And we and have some wonderful guests and wonderful stories to tell. And one of those guests is Eugene Skiff. Uh, he talks about his life with Steve Biko, whose anniversary is, of his death is tomorrow. He was the official artist for Biko's Black Consciousness Movement in the 70s. Uh, what does he say, for instance, about how he designed the first clenched fist icon that symbolized the people's power in the struggle for freedom. Uh, just share a snippet of some of your conversation. Eugene Skip is, is an extraordinary artist and uh, he has so many stories, uh, very intimate stories um, when he was with Steve Biko, um, stories which have never been heard or, you know, communicated anywhere else, you know, since Steve Biko died and, and why not? You know, he talks very fondly of the last days with Steve Biko, uh, the moment um, he heard he was arrested and when he died and all of that. He also talks about a whole range of South African artists who the world should know about. He talks about Becky and Suleku, who I heard Becky and Suleku on the piano and I thought this was an angel playing the piano when I closed my eyes. He, he was just beautiful, a real genius. But he also talks about Hugh Master Keller, Black Lady Smith, Black Mambazo, uh, Maria Matiba, oh, lots and lots of stories. And these are untold stories, which really would hearten the hearts of, of, of uh, you know, Africans around the world, inspire the musicians, the artists, and as it were, create another energy, which we, 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 we buy into to live our life better and create a better future for ourselves. Well, thank you so much for your time and your insights. Much, much appreciated. Dr. Kwesi Owusu, an award-winning artist, speaking to us live from London, where he says the mood is somber there. And Sir Queen's Elizabeth Coffin uh, arrives in Edinburgh after a journey from Balmoral. And, of course, he's reflecting on her influence on culture, particularly in the telling of the African story during uh, colonialism in the Commonwealth.